displays that displays the that displays the problematic. If you look at a guy like Godard, you know, what's the shtick of Godard? Why is Godard a revolutionary? Why did he change the nature of the game? I'll tell you why. It's very simple. I explained it to me, and I know exactly what it means. Okay, he said I wanted to be a filmmaker, and the problem that I had is I've never made films, and that film may, and film is light, and I had only a, I had two solutions: either I went to school and I learned how to light, and I hated school, and I didn't want to learn how to light. Or I ask myself a simple question. And what is that simple question? This is now me asking you a question. What is that simple question that this guy asks himself? And the question, I'm going to give you the answer so that we don't spend too much time on it. It's simply to say, what is the moment of the day where there is the less problems of lighting? And the answer is very simple. It's midday. The light falls straight down. There's no shadow. There's not the problem of creating shadow. If you do that, the figure becomes two-dimensional. The figure gets stuck like a butterfly against, the, against the, the, the background. And you are one step away from what Godard did. Instinctively, he used young people because they're always cute. <laughs> You know, old people are beautiful, young people are always cute. And then he does a second trick, he decided to swap them in primary colors. If you do that, a guy who started like they all started at the time of the, of the new wave, which is from a literary point of view, becomes a guy who has, like Alice, okay, crossed the mirror. And now you're in in something which has to do with painting and specifically which has to do with Matisse. So Godard is the guy who's, who made this paradigmatic, paradigmatic shift by which people suddenly, filmmakers suddenly, were confronted with the fact that it wasn't about literature, but it was about painting. It was about reading the image as if the image was effectively something which had to do with painterliness and composition. And consequently, it also had effects on the way you told story. Because it's a very different thing to tell a story from the perspective of this girl or this boy who had a love affair and have had a mommy and a daddy who tortured them so they can't get it up or they get it up too much or whatever, which is the same thing. And to say, I'm going to make a film where the essential, the essential element of the script is the fact that a girl with a blue dress and a yellow sweater moves in the space against, against, a, against a, 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 a white background from right to left. Which in a way put, you know, that famous picture of Jean-Luc putting, putting uh, flowers at Mizoguchi grave, it's because of that, because you can't understand a shot of uh, Imperatrice Yang Kifi without understanding that the real drama at stake is not this all complicated uh, soap opera about power, it's simply about a woman in a purple kimono walking across the stage against the backdrop of autumn leaves. And that's enough to make a film. That's enough to make a film. That's incredibly exciting. Okay? So Godard makes that shift. And it became it's a shift which is as important as the moment where Jackson Pollock puts the canvas on the floor and makes it very difficult for all a bunch of painters to stand in front of their easel and do that. That's a huge, it's, that's a huge intellectual change. Of course, you know, there is, there is one genius every, uh, every, every so often. So what generally happened when that kind of paradigmatic change, change has happened, a lot of Cretans come, come afterwards. And they decide to make a film that looks exactly like uh, uh, Edward Hopper, that's Dean Vanders, or looks exactly like, uh, like uh, 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 an impressionist painting. 
The problem is Godard doesn't make a film that looks like Matisse. He makes a film that reads like Matisse. And that's a fucking difference. Okay? So that's, that's the shtick. And we, that's the kind of stuff we, you know, I understood, we talked about, and we decided to, to play with it. And one of the things that, that came, came about, because we were thinking about the political form, is to explore that. At a moment when we had, that's the thing, you know, when I look back at the, at the Zigaretto group film, I said, my God, those films were done by Martians. Nobody would have the balls to make that, that kind of a film now. Okay? But they were, they were really a kind of very fundamental question as to what was going to happen to, to cinema. And we know what happened to it. It went back massively after many political defeat to what it was in its most academic, uninteresting fashion. You know, and that's it. So, um, you, you have to really say that there is a, there is a moment Time of cinema, where uh, suddenly it stopped being about literature and stopped being about painting. <coughs> and uh, there is a false impression that, that, that this line dividing one and another was with cinema without sound and cinema with sound. Um, but this, but no, 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 what's going on now, nowadays with all this digital revolution and all? Um, remember, I, was, uh, I told you I was going to ask you that question. So. Uh, yeah, well, I did say I was going to answer. <laughs> Limping confusion. I mean, first things first. You know, I mean, the entire history of cinema, the way we perceive it, is made of these absolutely farcical dichotomies. And those farcical dichotomies have had very profound effects. There are still festivals which call themselves documentary film festivals. And there's still festivals which call